Who am I? For what purpose am I living? And what is the sense in my existence? This ominous question haunts the modern world, an apparition that symbolizes the spirit of our age. The spectre may be deferred, but not ignored. Its disembodied sighing falls upon ears that refuse to hear it, its ghostly visage shimmering before eyes that refuse to see it. The macabre scene demands attention, yet man simply pushes it aside, believing he can circumvent it, or perhaps cheat his way out of it. Most are not even aware of the gravity of the situation. It is man's unwillingness to consider the possibility that the easiest solution is not always the correct one that prevents him from confronting the question directly. Instead, he tolerates its ugly presence. There, but not there. An immense weight pressing down upon his soul, visible only in his face. Man has become confused and unsure of himself in a world of his own creation that has lost direction and purpose. Is it not a quietly accepted fact that history no longer bears us forward in a rushing stream as it once did? But who is responsible for the woes of the modern world? Traditionally the answer given is that of the other man, the guilty party who can be captured and punished and eliminated. The other man is the other race, the other nation, and the other class. He is simultaneously the white man and the Jew, the capitalist and the communist, the gentry and the bourgeoisie. Many attempts have been made, and are still being made, to remove the other man from power, to destroy him and remove his evil influence on society. Millions of other men have been slaughtered and imprisoned. Yet the great question, the only question, of the modern age goes still unanswered. Who am I? For what purpose am I living? And what is the sense in my existence? The freedom to pursue happiness is the mantra of the modern state. I will be happy when I get that job, some say. Others say they will be happy when they move to a bigger city or pick up the latest technical gadget. Most of them are on some kind of drug designed to induce happiness. But nothing ever seems to change. The job they find unfulfilling, the city makes them feel lonelier, the gadget quickly loses its novelty, and the drug doesn't work. The compulsion to self-annihilate grows unabated. Modern man cries out in anguish because none of these things can provide an answer to the question asked. Who am I? For what purpose am I living? And what is the sense in my existence? It is easier to blame the other man than to consider the alternative. The truth, the hard truth, is that man himself is to blame. The physical world may be the cornerstone of human existence, but in basing himself solely upon it, man ignores an essential part of his being. Man's existence has become senseless and rooted in despair, because nothing on this earth can provide a definitive answer to his question. In affirming despair, he affirms nothingness. The affirmation of nothingness begets evil. God can only be found by those who expect to find him. The admission of one's guilt is the first step towards salvation. To find God, man must willingly become nothing, but then transcend it. It is a senseless existence that bases itself on physical realities alone, for man is an unfinished and imperfect being who can never say with certainty of himself who he is and to what end he is alive and what is the meaning of his existence. Martin Luther wrote, It is God's nature to make something out of nothing. Therefore God cannot make anything of someone who is not yet nothing. When the nature of man becomes a problem, it is clear that whatever had previously given it security has come to an end. Man's ontology no longer rests on a solid foundation, the 19th century released him from the unconscious security of religion into the volatile insecurity of science and technology. Life is fundamentally mysterious, and meaning cannot be found in systems that reduce the world to lifeless mechanism. A scientist who discovers a new scientific truth always emerges with bloody hands from the butchering of the one he just made false. Previously, man did not feel the need to ask the question, who he is and why he exists but now it has become a matter of life and death. This modern crisis is a specifically Western crisis that is now brought to the whole world. It began with skepticism and ends with nihilism, 
with the individual passing from doubt into despair. Man is unlike the plants and animals that populate this earth, for the nature of their being is raw and pure. They possess a natural unity of inner world, body and outer world. Man does not have this perfect, natural unity. Self-awareness brings with it awareness of the world as an opposite object, and the permanent anguish of realizing oneself as an alien being. Man has never felt himself truly of this world. Human civilization is the synthetic construct by which man suppresses this anguish through an artificial three-in-one unity, consisting of consciousness, instrument, and culture. Man's labors via instrument are driven by a cosmic inner power through which consciousness and culture arose. Man gave a name to this cosmic power. He called it God. Man is an imperfect being. He makes an appearance on Earth for a short while, but just as quickly disappears into the ether from which he came. The ultimate reality of his world is ever becoming. No man-made creation has lasting permanence. But man would not be conscious of his imperfection if he did not bear within himself the image of perfection, the world of being. In other words, God's living reality. Culture and consciousness have never been anything more than allegories. They are a means to an end. They do not possess any value in themselves, but rather point to something else beyond this world. The sublimity of God floats behind every note of genuine Western music, and the freedom of choice placed in us by him is explored in every Western play and novel. But culture and consciousness, as ever becoming creations of man, can never be considered complete and perfect, nor can they ever confer that status upon man himself. History shows that all high cultures collapse at the peak of perfection. The closer man gets to perfection, the more he feels tugged by the demonic temptation to take culture and consciousness as things in themselves. In basing himself upon these things, man's existence becomes contradictory, because they in turn base their existence on man. The actuality of all three has been placed in a very great danger. Human civilization is a delicate apparatus. It is built on authority and assumes a stable and unchanging type of man. All that one does must never pass beyond the limits of the norm if the apparatus is to work. But when the nature of man is called into question, its gears clog up and it ceases to function properly. Modern man believes consciousness is the measure of all things. A person's worth these days is not measured by piety or virtue, but by cold, hard intelligence. If a man is poor, it is because he is stupid. If a people are poor, it is because their entire race is stupid. Man looks upon his fellow man with contempt and looks down on anything that could hurt his fragile ego. It is due to this attitude that a great purging of authority has taken place, that element so crucial to the smooth working of the apparatus. For over 200 years, man has been busily engaged in smashing any hierarchy he can find and bringing all men crashing down to a certain level. Nobody has survived, not the king nor the priest, not even the teacher or the judge. When we observe modern man meeting with a figure that has historically been in a position of authority, such as the priest, we no longer find shepherd and flock opposed, but man meeting man on a basis of equal rights. If consciousness does not look upward, then how dare one man have authority over another? That truth comes from below has become the most sacred assumption of the modern age. The collapse of authority in the public sphere begins in the private sphere. A man's children may ask him, by reason of what human values do you as our father enjoy an authority before which we have to bow? For you can as little derive this authority from a marriage or birth certificate as from the fact that you put us into the world. The father has no response, for he received his position, he did not create it. His claim to authority over his family collapses under such questioning. The traditional image of his family shatters, leading to the emancipation of his daughters and the rebellion of his sons. Now, on the rare occasion he attempts to show authority, he is demonized and made a villain. The father was made impotent in his own home. Modern man might say, if there really were a god, he would not allow such evil in the world. This tells us a great deal about him. The God who judges and punishes and rages is beyond his reach, 
for his ego abhors the idea of someone or something being superior to him. In his mind, he is the smug autocrat of his own world, a kingdom unto himself. God's position at the apex of the hierarchy is invisible to the mind of a man who can only look horizontally. God's image has therefore been reduced to a feeble geriatric in a wheelchair, who may be pleased by his grandchildren's good behaviour, but is physically unable to punish them if they misbehave. The fact that God is no longer perceived as being capable of influencing events closes man off to the unconscious security provided by divine causality. Anguish is a permanent component of human existence, and modern man meets it entirely on his own. There can no longer be any positivity attached to suffering. What began with intoxicated liberty has now sank into the slavery of despair. Kierkegaard wrote that only inward-turned reflection has a real relationship to a person's actual existence. Men today are blind to this fact, as they can only perceive externally, causally, that is to say, they do not perceive at all. Here we have the crisis of perception. Modern man takes the symptoms of this crisis and passionately declares war on them. Much ink has been spilled in the feverish scribblings of men who believe it is society's job to create and give happiness to the individual. When the individual is unhappy, society is at fault and is in need of fixing. But these efforts can never have any effect because economic and scientific lenses are blind to the true nature of the crisis. Modern society relies more and more on science and technology in pursuit of a better life and in doing so has inevitably succumbed to their demonic temptation from which it is almost impossible to escape. The further man drifts from God, the more he perversely endeavours to become God. After all, modern science is only possible with the idea of a creation that follows its creator's rules. Man created technology, but he does not possess technology. He may still believe he is the one in possession, when in reality it has come to possess him. The thrill of driving a car almost imperceptibly invites a man to become a car man, thus the created instrument itself becomes a demonic creator. The nature of this Faustian pact allows man to enter into a kind of symbiotic relationship with technology, but in return he has become half a man. The half man bases his existence on the material reality of the apparatus, the very nature of which has become totalitarian. The total state is the state of half men, where everything in a person's existence is controlled by the apparatus, like an experiment in a laboratory. Man is coming to realize the inescapable horror that is modern civilization. The modern city has become a colossal torture chamber that dehumanizes individuals and destroys their humanity. Millions of human beings live caged like rats, robbed of the essential breathing room required for the healthy development of mind and spirit. The ideal of the big city, which once sucked the countryside dry, has been reversed. Now people idealize small country houses and escape from the brutality of life in the megalopolis. But culture, which was once made to serve man, has too undergone a reversal. Man must now adapt himself to serve the apparatus. Escape has been made exceedingly difficult, if not impossible. Modern man lives in a world where every one of his steps has been carefully pre-calculated by state and society before he was even conceived. The massed community of half-men, which we will refer to as the body collective, takes this to be perfectly normal, perhaps even desirable, for it is the only existence that they have ever known. The body collective does not distinguish between subject and object, I and the world. Instead, it has a collective we pre-consciousness that might be found in a primitive tribe. Indeed, in modern times we once again have tribal vengeance. This is the phenomenon of the other man. Every modern ideology since the end of the Middle Ages has been yet another attempt to make a certain body collective the supreme source of authority instead of God. We has taken precedence over I. Man no longer stands as an individual before the perfection of God, but as just another face among the multitude. The individual cries out in helplessness as he is crushed on the unbearable weight of the totality of apparatus and body collective pressing down upon him. The totality opposes everything that has location and purpose. The death of the individual inevitably carries with it the deaths of originality and creativity. A true diagnosis of the catastrophe of the modern world therefore requires one to stand outside the body collective as an individual and dispassionately observe the crisis as one would observe a distant mountaintop on the horizon. 
or in this case, the growth of a tumor. The doctrine of faith in culture and consciousness has brought about a leveling of society. On the level, every man is at one and the same moment both the apex and the base of the pyramid. Men no longer receive their positions from above, but must now fight with tooth and nail to preserve the tiny scrap of the level that they have carved out for themselves. The question of one's identity becomes cardinal. Who am I, and what is the meaning of my existence? The individual who once affirmed his identity granted upon him by God must instead fashion an identity for himself to prove to the body collective that he is free and independent. But his fellow men do not care about him, for they are already looking to do the same thing. In the world of the body collective, one must either sink or swim. Suddenly, man has found himself in the position of having no one to reassure him, to tell him who he is, why he is living, and what is the meaning of his existence. The level has produced a new type of man who takes great pleasure in subjecting the world to his handcrafted identity. The most successful of these men are the Caesars, those who raise themselves above the tumult of the level and offer the masses the spectacle of a star blazing across the firmament. In the 21st century, this has become a truly dire circumstance. Caesarism can now be found anywhere and everywhere across the world, in films, industry, the internet, the media, even in government. Mass culture finds itself revolving more and more around their dazzling personalities and spectacular achievements. Democracy will prove to be its own destructor, as its very principles open the door for Caesarism to dismantle it. The Caesars should never be evaluated highly, however, whatever they may achieve, for theirs is always a dominion over nothing, over the chaos of nihilism, raised upon the rubble and ruins of the human image. As soon as man begins to ask the question, who am I and what is the meaning of my existence, he enters into a crisis of instability that cannot be resolved until the question is answered. But it cannot be answered by rational means, for it is by his faith in consciousness that man arrived at the question in the first place. The answer cannot be given to him. He must find it within himself. It is only through re-establishing a connection to God that man can understand what has actually been lost in his rebellion against authority. In the name of freedom, man declared himself the measure of all things, but lost his freedom when he became burdened with the unanswerable question of his own existence. Through God, the individual may find freedom once more.